my name's Glyn Pooley and I'd like to talk about art. This time, my subject is... Let's take a trip into another world. Again, fascinating. Native North American Indian art. So, back in time, tens of thousands of years, of course, when we look at the native peoples, we're seeing certain patterns. Their way of co connecting and combining and sharing information is kind of universal, as we saw with the Aboriginals painting on the caves and etching into the surfaces. Uh, we've got it here. Different imagery. That's what's fascina fascinating about it as well. Um, and in this case, not so much painting on the surface, but carving into the rock, as you can see, petroglyphs. And the iconography is traditionally that blending of information again. So we got layer and layer of information from the, the tradition, from the, the environment that's around them, and an insight into their patterns of thinking, their different culture. So we can see things like the buffalo, of course, being etched on there, um, which are pretty straightforward and recognisable. But then we have these strange kind of uh, imagery, which is appearing. They look kind of human, but they also look like something from another planet, <laughs> you, could, you could say. And these part of the fundamental makeup of the Native American uh, structure. And it's something which is a theme which, of course, will run through this when we look at this art form. And then you'll be able to tie it into the overlaps of thought processes that we had with the Aboriginal artists. So let's look at the imagery. You know, as you said, tens of thousands of years ago, for a long time, so it's a, it's a very long tradition again, right up until, say, the beginning of the 1500s, when the colonials arrived, firstly the Spanish and then waves of others. So they'd been living in tandem with the land and been very, well, very connected with it and built up a whole series of ways of relating to it. When the colonials arrived, there, there was hundreds of different tribes, probably a million inhabitants already in uh, North, North America. And when you think about it, this is, you know, since colonization, it's a relatively short period of time because these tribes fundamentally were intact right up until the 1890s, some of them. Um, you know, there was famous battles in the 1860s, 1870s, but right up to the 1890s, they were there. And some have managed to survive and continue. So we can build on what they've told us over more recent times and shown us, as well as what we've got from ancient documentation. So this, when we look at this imagery, we've got this idea of this main central figure. We see the idea of the headdress and the decoration. They're holding something in both, both hands, and they're within a kind of small group. The things that they could be holding, this could be kind of some kind of rattle, and this is an iconic shape or form, which has kind of got an energy to it. It could be like a, the power of the sun. Um, but this central figure then, it would be perceived as the shaman. And the shaman would be the kind of leader of the particular tribe that had to deal with all kinds of uh, issues that the tribe might face. And um, they were there as a way of kind of appeasing the spirit gods and connecting with nature and enabling the tribe to prosper. Now, this is important because that a lot of iconography and imagery of Native American art comes from that focus. So this is another one slightly later now, obviously, it places it because the horse is a part of the um, etchings. Now we're in Arizona, fascinating area for Native American Indians and part of the place where they have been, they've still kind of flourished. We know they've all been pushed onto reservations. Uh, they said the same with the Aboriginals, which is a bit unfortunate, but some of the Native American Indian cultures have kind of drawn and 
I wouldn't say flourish, but that they've significantly kept their culture very much, very much alive. So the imagery of the horse was introduced, as I said, by the, by the Spanish. They would have been uh, brought over early 1500s. And the Indians kind of adapted them. They worked with these, with these animals and they became great horsemen. Comanche in the south, you know, and other groups that were on the plains. And they used them for the hunting. So you can see like this is a kind of hunting scene, whether they be hunting buffalo or other animals with prairie dogs around. And then they're documenting what their community are doing, what their community achieving, how they go about it. And then they share that with their tribes in their particular areas. And then this happy looking fellow that looks as if he's had a few too many whiskies is the, um, the medicine man, um, another central person for for the tribe the tribal elder and the structure of the tribe of course the, the, they they had the main essential uh, people that had to share all the ancestral information pass it down through myths and legends and share it at the the gatherings that they they would have had and as we saw this idea of the mask has been really important whether it be when we looked at the african art you know parts of uh, all different African tribes had their own ritualistic marks, Aboriginal and, and here again. Now this is, this mask is kind of, kind of scary in a way, looking at it. It's about transformation. So it's transforming the figure that wore it, the person that wore it in a way that they could connect with the spirits and the spirits were really important for native people. You know, we talk about animism, the idea where everything is alive, everything has its own kind of uh, energy force and characteristic, whether it be a mountain or whether it be a river or whether it be a particular animal. And it was for these medicine ma men to be able to connect with that and to uh, connect with the land and for the resources that would, that would heal. Heal people physically, mentally as well. And, you know, uh, taking a holistic approach you can see this being decorated this is a hard wood and then on the top this could be horse's hair or something like that but fascinating fascinating image some of them are quite strong and striking as you can see here because of their connection with the spirits sometimes some of the spirits were not that helpful to the tribe as you say the, the shamans had to be able to try and commune with nature, which was incredibly important, and try and bring rains when it was needed or, you know, different benevolent form aspects into the tribe. Um, and they had to scare away the malevolent ones, ones which were not so helpful. And you can see this would scare away almost anyone, wouldn't it? You know, could be beneficial sometimes, depending where we're wandering, but gives you plenty of scope if you want to make um, one of these special masks, you know. So you'd be thinking about what you're trying to attract to you or what you're trying to repel and uh, make the mask or the shape or the portrait, you know, accordingly. Uh, yeah, wouldn't want to meet this character in the late in night. <laughs> but uh, real strength to them, as you can see when we, when we look at them. They take you back just looking at them straight away, even from our culture that's a long way away from, from this now. Um, and we have to transport ourselves back, you know, hundreds and, you know, going further than hundreds and hundreds of years and try and get ourselves into the mindset of how these people were, were thinking when we're making these and linking with these art forms and artworks. And this is another mask from the northwest region, different area, different iconography on it, different kinds of coloration. Um, this, these tribes, probably the Haida tribe, more concerned and linked with the sea. They were closer, so it was on the border of Canada and Canada. So you can see you've got elements which are the sea lion and different fish. And then they might have, you know, a symbol of a particular bird, could be a crow. Each animal had its own, own characteristics. And they took on the, if they wore the mask of those animals, they took on the characteristics of those animals. Interesting, these are all held together with this hand. You can see the hand and the fingers there. 
So, you know, if you're thinking about making your own mask or your own picture of it, you've got to try and link with the characteristics of the particular animal. You want that force to go in you and be part of you and to help overcome any specific or any particular problem you're trying to, you found yourself encountering. Um, and this one, which is a Hopi headdress, ceremonial headdress. The Hopi are really rich culture. They're based around, again, the south, southern west part of um, uh, America, near the Grand Canyon. And they, they've left a massive legacy, and they still use it today. Quite a broad culture of ways of expressing their, their, their art. Um, and you can see this one, the headdress is slightly different, different, uh, worn in a different way. It's got this kind of, this almost looks like a building in the background, structurally, you know, so it's a flat structure attracted to the, to the top of the headdress, which would make it even more impressive because it's even bigger. And then they've added other elements to it, like basketry, the weaving, like we saw in the African art from member book of faso some of those uh, amazing costumes that they were wearing so th they're using similar kinds of materials to share and commune with the with the spirit gods and then the the, the structure of these marks which come repeat over and over in their different culture um, and their iconography which their tr particular tribe would understand their certain colorations which they understand and they share look into that a little bit more um, and then you've got this amazing thing kachina spirit doll every house should have one <laughs> these like dolls that have been created by the elders that hold benevolent forces for the tribe they were said to kind of come and live with the tribe for six months of the year before they wandered up into the mountains. So they were used for ceremonies. They were brought into the ceremony, and if they were there, they were going to be helping the tribe to overcome its particular difficulties. You can see the same kind of imagery that we saw on that ceremonial headdress being placed there. You can see elements of different animals are being attached to this to this doll. Forces of those animals are then imbued into the doll if you like and it's a carried as a kind of central um, iconic force um, and it's interesting how they perceive the world like that and you might have had something i don't know if you were when you were growing up or whatever a favorite toy even that you imbued when you were very young you might have even talked to it you might have really engaged with it in all kinds of ways so you have a very rich real dialogue and then you imbue this object with a special kind of understanding. You might take that object to certain places with you that means something, you know, like different football teams or whatever, they have their own mascot. And if they got their mascot with them, they're gonna, you know, it's gonna help them do better. And these are a little bit like that, but they, you know, they've been passed on for generation, generation with the iconography and imbued with these different forces. And then if they were there, at the ceremony they were gonna they were gonna help so you might want to paint your own kachina doll with icon iconic kind of elements to it you might even if you're handy you might even make one you know a little sculpture like that or attach it to a canvas but it's something that would be special to you and then if you share that information with your tribe <laughs> your family whatever you want to call them then there's the force increases with it okay so inanimate objects become very animate then they become very much alive because they have a communal force to them and that's what the kind of idea is behind these kind of objects and this idea of the force be with you <laughs> to take on uh, luke skywalker is what you've got here you've got indian headdress whereby it's decorated and supported by all these feathers around the outside they're probably eagle feathers. The eagle and the hawk were very important 
to the these tribes, particularly if they were going to go into battle. Uh, because they're predatory birds and they have certain characteristics, they think by wearing the forces of those particular animals, they take on that force when they're going to go into any particular situation. It's a deep, strong belief in the power of nature and the power of everything else that is around you and being open to it. As we saw, when the colonials went into that, they had their own force and nature, mainly guns and things like that, and the feathers and bows and arrows weren't quite as effective, but they did really pretty well, particularly certain tribes, you know, they did overcome even the guns and all the rest of it. And as we see culturally, their iconography they've left behind is even most it's much stronger than we kind of think so things like headdresses indian headdresses they use you know and people use them even in our culture to decorate themselves at a particular time and share that particular information this is another iconic kind of artifact but it was an object of practic practical object for native american indians that has come into popular culture like the dream catcher is something which is particularly fascinating. It was suspended at the head, behind the head of a sleeping child in a cot, to catch to capture any unwanted dreams, any particular nightmares or anything like that. They'd all get caught in this so the child could sleep sleep well. And, and that idea of filtering out certain information from our subconscious is something which. Uh, is still prevalent and studied in the West, particularly in the 20th century. I'm thinking of Freud and I'm thinking of Jung and people like that. They were concerned about the dream state, but as the dream state for Native American Indians, particularly Hopi Indians, was a big part of their the way they lived their lives. If they were aware and could tune in to those different messages and ideas which were being passed through their dreams, then that was going to help their, their day and their cycle of their years. So the dream catcher was one way of uh, manifesting it in an object. And you can see this in a slightly more modern one. It's very striking. It's interesting when we start to think about the iconography that they passed, whether it be on, whether it be things like the dream catchers or the headdresses, there's so many other things, you know, like from the moccasins that they, they wear, you know, people go out and wear those now actually got a pair myself lovely comfortable uh, bit of bit of footwear and this is all just being blended and imbued in our culture now ways of creating art as we saw there's many ways but sand painting for central american indians and southern western indians was a big way of sharing information and what they're painting but the you know, spirit iconography, these, the things that the shamans or their ancestors have learned, and then they're, they're placed and created on the ground, sometimes outside, sometimes in their, their, their meeting places. And then they will be the centerpiece again for the ceremony, the ritual ceremonies where they come together. And they would know the iconography so they could share it and, and understand it and pass it, pass it on. And these artists would get into a really deep state of med deep meditative state to be able to share the relevant information at a particular time. And of course, the ancestors would pass down this information to the tribe, which would be ben beneficial. It's interesting, this way of painting, this sand painting, is also something that, yeah, we, we would see in Aboriginal art, but we also see it in Tibetan art as well, where they make these incredible mandalas. And in their case, they make them for the ceremony, maybe eight or ten monks getting together. And then when they're finished, they sweep them all up and put them in a bowl, and then they probably send it out into the sea. So it's about, you know, nothing is permanent. Everything is temporary in that kind of state. And, you know, with these... Some of the native tribes were quite nomadic, of course. They didn't carry all these these things on like this. You know, their artworks and canvases like we do in the West. They would use it, make it, share it for that specific purpose, get people together for it, and then it could go off 
back up into the spirit world. You could be blown, blown away. But the imagery could still be shared in a very fundamental way. The act of actually making it and touching the land as well is very healing in lots of ways. So for the artists making it, touching the land, and for the other people that are part of their tribe, they could go and put their hand near it. Even if it's just for a few seconds, it's got a healing quality because it's been imbued with such force from the, the artist or the shaman or the ancestor. Um, and that's all part of the process. And this just gives us some insight into some of the iconography that they used. Some, you know, we read today very easily, like the moon. They've got symbol for the morning, the noon, and the evening. And interesting, really, because other, another icono iconography they use is the star. So they particularly a lot of store by the morning star and the evening star. I suppose being outside, being in clear skies, the heavens, like we saw with the Aboriginals, plays a much stronger part than we get an opportunity to experience most of the time. So that these kind of forces, these heavenly forces, these big forces are very strong in their iconography. Symbol of lightning, makes sense. Obviously rainbow, you know, very similar to the Aboriginals. TP, you know, wigwam as we call it, house. <laughs> Blossom, interesting, it's got eight, eight parted wheels, eight parts of that wheels. The rain coming down from the heavens. Campfires, like different to the Aboriginals, but there it is. The flames and campfire. Hunt, obviously, arrow. Happy, you know, happy has got the center of the soul betrayed, but reaching outwards again. So there's happiness. Spring, look at that. It's a lovely way. Spring, everything's starting to burst upwards. Grass is growing. Looks like a comb, doesn't it? But spring is there it's going upwards. Fabulous. Interesting. Summer's much bigger. Look up the higher there. Fast. Yeah, iconography for fast, you know, it's like a like your lightning going in a particular way. You know, they used that in comic strips and all kinds of things. Deer, footprints, of course, bird tracks, different ones to the Aboriginals for man and woman. River, sun, yeah, you can read all that. Something that's sad. It's interesting, isn't it? Sad, there's no arms reaching out. There's no connection, so you're sad. God, just a few lines. It sums it up, doesn't it? The camp, obviously, a few teepees put together. Horse track, mountains, friendship. Those arrows are now not had part of the hunting. They're put together, they're crossing each other. They're overlaying each other. Good luck, you know, something stable, something solid, something square is a symbol of good luck, but it's reaching out as well with those little arms going outwards. Good crops, yeah. the triangles form, it's a very strong growth pattern. And war, because they're separate, you know. Friendship together, war, separation, not good. And then the bare, barefoot. So, you know, thinking of simple iconography that you could put into your artwork, that's really fundamental. You know, these are, these are ancient, as we said, and they repeat for all these ancient cultures so that are all in our DNA as, as well. So it's interesting to share and look at those. And this is a, a little mosaic or a sand painting using some of that iconography with the information radiating out, radiating out in unity. See, there's elements of happiness, there's the elements of sun, there's elements of connection, there's elements of movement going out. So there's forces, there's a real force to that. Um, and it's almost interesting because it looks like a Eastern mandala as well, which they contemplate on, which we'll have a look at when we look at what people like Raza. But using natural materials, the earth pigments on the land to share and say what they want to share and then basket weaving the thing is with these native people they decorated everything everything around them that was part of their life they imbued it with extra care and attention particularly for ceremonial purposes but just generally so if they make a basket they make it with beauty and with intention and share information that can connect with their community You'll see it also with blankets, they'll do the same kind of thing. They'll do it with their houses, all aspects, the whole holistic approach. Art and creativity is one for the native pe peoples. And it's been their life force that has not only kept their culture alive, but has supported their communities often on the reservations. So here with this basket, 
weaving. This is probably the Hopi. They were particularly good at it. You've got uh, being, it's interesting that they would use like either grasses or sometimes they would use the bark of say a, a cedar tree stripped down, which was a bit more hard wearing, mat it into these amazing structures and then imbue it with the iconography of what we got here is an image of a thunderbird where the thunderbirds are go. There's a force to a thunderbird that the Native Americans, it repeats over and over in their culture. A uh, bird, of course, is something which has got freedom and flight. And thunder was such a powerful force. You can imagine listening out, listening to thunder in some of those places. And the, the, the oncoming of a storm or whatever uh, was understood by the tribal leader. So they combined the two ideas of the, the bird and the thunder. Um, to um, uh, share information and then you've got the butterfly there with all its beauty and fragility and na natural forms enriching the whole object itself so making it an object of beauty ob object of transferring information object that has got a real spiritual content to it in the way it's being created and made as i said this is a blanket a hopi blanket using their iconography again this is these are the spirit gods that they they were aware of this is the structures of their maybe gathering houses gathering places spirit and spirit animals there and it's all kind of it's something which would be laid out on the ground at ceremonies but also it was something that they wore daily they would they would wrap it around themselves these blankets and keep themselves warm in the night and they keep themselves warm but they keep themselves Selves protected as well, protect from the material elements, but protected spiritually by wrapping themselves in this particular iconography. Uh, and these were prized objects, some of them, that they would uh, share when the, the different tribes got together. Um, sharing was very important in the tribal meetings because it made the tribe stronger. It's an interesting cultural difference when they gave something between shared something between the different tribes the idea was to give as much as you possibly could to the other tribe so that you were sharing as much of yourself as you could with them and it wasn't about receiving it was about giving <laughs> and here we got another icon aspect of native american art uh, the, the totem poles these are from the Hyder people in the northwestern region. These mark the center of their ceremonial areas and they told the history of their culture and their ancestry, usually made out of cedar, um, which was, you know, an evergreen tree. So it had significance, powerful all the year through. And then these two different aspects of tradition was uh, laid out. Fascinating, amazingly beautiful. And their scale is is immense, as well as you can see. They would now take some carving. Often they got the eagle on the top, force of the eagle, and then these different animals, one laid on top of the other, just giving that totem more and more strength. These were totem animals for that particular tribe, and they all emerged out of myths and stories. Let's have a look at one or two. One which repeats itself a lot is the beaver. So the beaver is an old, wise builder, creative, artistic and determined, strong sense of family, builder of dream. And an eagle, ruler of the sky, great strength, leadership, prestige, divine spirit, connection to the creator. The frog, spring, a new, new life, communicator, stability, rich in life, survivalist, connection to the water element. Each animal has its own characteristic and um, life-giving force that when they connected with it, they could share that in their day-to-day -day life because this pole, this totem pole, was at the centre of their village. It was the centre of, the, of their life. So no matter where they went, they could always refer to it. And it told their historical story as well. The hawk, strength, quick to assist, when in need of help, a messenger, stopper of time. And these stories and these myths that were behind these, they would have been taught to the children 
so they would be really deeply aware of what was being shared with them and they grew up with it so these forces were strong within them the owl wisdom watchful perseverance respected may be associated with death <laughs> it's all about balance of course in life for some of these things the way they're being described are still the way we can perceive them now even from our distance perspective in the west so when we start thinking and looking at different animals around us, whether it be the birds out in the garden, whether it's the dog sitting in your living room, they've all got life forces and certain characteristics to them. They've all got their own kind of personalities, we know, but there's something deeper within them that you can think about and you can relate to. And then when you make your painting or artwork, you can share that. So when you create your artwork, you're not just sharing the outer image, of the dog or whatever that's in front of you, you're sharing this in, inner image. It's in a deeper a soul, spirit or understanding, as you can see from this, these images here. And then when you lay them one on top of the other, you can see this multi, multiple information comes across and they become incredibly rich and deep, beautifully decorated as well. Wonderful, wonderful pieces. And uh, they, when the tribes came together, they would meet around this totem pole. And, you know, they, they were iconic. They had an amazing one, which was uh, known as the totem pole of peace, where the five, five major tribes came together around it and celebrated the ceremony, shared their information with each other and connected to build a stronger partnership and life force. And let's look at some of the other iconography and the way they're put together um, as well. This is mainly from the northwest area, so it gives you an idea of the basic components. The oval, inner ovoid, the U-form, uh, the split U-form, and the S-form. You know, in uh, cultures in, if you say, the west, if you like, we've often concentrated on angular forms, you know, construction, the square, the rectangle, are harder angled, diagonals. Here you can see the native people are more about circles, they're more about S's, they're more about U, they're more about curvilinear aspects in their creation of their art forms. So it's about smoothness, it's about flow, it's about that kind of thing. Um, so we've got the beaver on the left hand side, fish and different aspects come together, uh, birds, figures on the right one there. And what I was saying earlier about them decorating and be part of their, their whole community, all aspects of their community, from the totem poles there, iconography, to their meeting houses. You know, imagine painting your house with all this different information. Yeah, it might be fascinating and look fabulous. Might probably won't get past local planning. It'd be amazing, you know, to have uh, all your iconography of yourself and your tribe and your ancestors painted all over your house. Because all that information is shared then, it's all kind of understood. And these are amazing buildings, as you can see. They were probably lived in in the summer months and parts of the year they were ceremonial buildings. But these, these are particularly interesting, good examples of them. But so rich, you know, you go on top again. Wonderful. Let's look at another one, beaver. It's an important crest, subject to many le legends. This gives an idea of how their thought process was. One legend tells of the origin of the beaver. A woman with brown hair dammed a small stream to make a pool for swimming. As she swam, her leather apron kept slapping the water. The pool became a lake, and because of scolding words, words from her husband, she refused to leave it. Yeah, she became covered with brown fur. Her apron turned into a tail, and thus she became the first beaver. Beaver reminds us that we have to act on our dreams to make them a reality. There's a good one. Creative, artistic, and determined like you are. Also known as the carpenter of the animal kingdom, a builder of dreams. We love that. We got our builders of dreams, which are fascinating. And then one last one from the Hyder group. You can see that because their emphasis is more on, and they're more connected to the sea. You've got, you know, elements that come from the fish or these could be killer whales, things like that with their characteristics, with the beaver, uh, with different animals. So they overlay a number of creatures together with their different characteristics 
to to give a more rich sharing of the iconography uh, and I thought we'll have to look at a couple of contemporary Native American Indians and what the work that they're doing now as well. But I thought this one was particularly ironic, of course, reflecting on the history of Nicholas Gallin. And the American dream is still alive and well in 2012. Fabulous. It's, you know, it's quite clever, isn't it? The Native American people, of course, were so connected to the animals and the animal world. They gave them such reverence and relevance. They all had a spirit and their force. And then the colonials go in and they did kind of have had this way of neglecting all this. So what do they do? They just shoot a bear and they use it as a carpet. <laughs> they walk all over it, you know. Ironically, these stars, they've taken for their Stars and Stripes national flag. But these were Indian. This is Indian iconography taken from their morning and evening style that I referred to earlier. But uh, that poor old bear that splashed out across the, the carpet on the floor now that they're walking over has been brought about, of course, by its paws of bullets. So the poor old Native American Indians have suffered through that, through that path. So that's an ironic one. And then we got this beautiful one by James Lavador. As we said, the Native Americans, they use decorate all kinds of aspects of their day-to-day -day life. And we, we saw one of the Hopi blankets. So he's used this theme of a blanket. And these are uh, oil paintings painted on panel and have been assembled as one large blanket. He's a fabulous artist in terms of the way he connects with, with the land. The colours are wonderful, as you can see. The iconography and his connection with the land, I think he's from Oregon comes through. He works in traditional mediums now, oil on canvas. He's also a printmaker and he sometimes works, he works on about 50 canvases or so 50 panels at a time in his great big warehouse that he's got uh, and just slowly builds them up as abstract shapes, abstract forms, but he's so connected with the land. As you can see, they take on the shape of the land that he's being brought up in and information being passed down to him. Um, and then it kind of links with these other little temporary buildings that look like tents, just like the wigwam, the, the meeting houses and things like that, which are overlaid it. And it makes for a really strong and striking, striking image. So he's a contemporary living artist working today. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification.